In today's video, I'm going to be talking about the second part of why global migration is complex. Uh, the bits I'm going to be covering today are about the high concentration of young workers and female migrants and how conflict has led to an increased number of refugees. Again, this is OCR A-level geography spec. So the first area I'm going to cover is an increase in female migrants. Um, so in the 21st century, we've seen not only the number, but the proportion in terms of overall migrants increase for female migrants. So in the 60s, it was about 46.6%, but by 2020, that's nearly 48.1%. So that's getting uh, to close to the same proportions as uh, male migrants. Not only has it changed in terms of the number of proportions, but the reasons why we're getting larger female migration have changed. So traditionally, female migration would have been often driven by um, women uh, reuniting with their families or migrating as part uh, with their partner as a dependent. Um, so often if they were married, they would move with their partner um, or as refugees. It's not to say that these, those have completely disappeared. Those are all still factors why women would migrate. But what we're starting to see increasingly is that there are more female migrants who are migrating, first of all, on their own. And also, more importantly, for economic or education opportunities. So the role of um, female migrants as economic migrants and wage earners has become increasingly important in the 21st century. However, this isn't uniform across the whole of um, the globe. There are clear regional differences. So we can see um, here from the diagram that in Europe and North America, you get a lot more women migrating than you do in Asia and Africa. Some of the reasons why we get more um, female migrants in developed countries, why we're getting higher numbers, uh, is because of some of the differences and the benefits that those women might have compared to women in other parts of the world. So often they have greater freedoms and um, legal rights. Uh, women's rights movement has uh, gained a lot of um, recognition since the 1960s. So we have Equality Acts in the UK, which means that you can't be discriminated um, for a job depending on your sex. Um, we've also seen a, a global improvement in access to education for women, and especially that has been very forthcoming in developed countries. But we've also seen things like medical improvements. So the contraceptive pill came in in the 60s, which meant that women weren't just necessarily seen as uh, there to produce children and look after children, but it gave them more independence. And that meant they could go on to pursue economic opportunities. So all of these kind of factors have meant that Women in developed countries often have greater rights, but also greater independence and therefore are more likely to become economic migrants. And we're seeing the case that in, in many developed countries, the percentage of female migrants is actually higher now than men. Equally, there are barriers that are stopping um, women from migrating in other areas. So we talked about how Asia and Africa, there was uh, significantly less um, female migrants. It's not only because of these, but these are factors that can play a part. So in some developing countries, there is less access to education opportunities for women. So it means they're less likely to kind of be in the labour market and therefore they don't have the financial freedom to be able afford to migrate. We see that there are still patriarchal um, societies, restrictive norms where the women are still seen to be there to be domestic and raise children. And that's um, obviously embedded in culture uh, and therefore takes a lot to shift. We also see that this can affect some of the legal and political restrictions. So there are some countries where women can't physically actually leave a country unless they've been given permission from uh, a, a, f a male guardian. Um, for example, Iran's a good example um, and there's a very famous example of the captain of the Iranian football team wasn't allowed to go and play in a tournament overseas because her husband um, didn't sign approval for her to get a passport. So we can see that there are restrictive measures that might actually stop some women from being able to just leave a country, uh, along with the kind of social, cultural and economic issues. Another example was um, Nepal in 2017 actually banned domestic uh, female migrants from, from leaving Nepal to go to um, work in the Gulf states like Saudi Arabia and the UAE. 
This was uh, uh, done under the, the guise of trying to protect them from being trafficked, but it essentially meant that they couldn't move. So there are, are lots of barriers still to why certain um, women can't move in different parts of the world. The next category is the high concentration of young migrants. As we can see from both of these graphs, um, we are often getting younger people migrating in terms of international migration. On the right, it shows you um, where immigrants have come from to the UK over a period of time. And we can see that it is skewed very, very much to the younger ages. Uh, similarly, if I look at all the immigrants um, that are entering the EU, compared to um, what people who are, are actually nationals of those countries now, we see on the blue line that it's much more skewed to a younger age. So they are often younger. Why do we get younger people migrating? Well, First of all, they don't have any dependents. They're less likely to have kids or be married, so they've got more freedom to move. But more importantly, they're actually moving because they are more likely to get better employment opportunities, therefore make better wages, and therefore they can send remittances back to their families um, at home and uh, support their families in that more effective way. An example of this is the fact that we've got lots of young male workers going to work in the UAE in Saudi Arabia. These male workers, as we've discussed before, would be from India and Bangladesh, a south to south migration, because there's lots of opportunities in construction. So they can make lots of money there and then return to their countries or send remittances back. Um, the FIFA World Cup at the moment is one of those examples where there's lots of opportunities for young male workers, low skilled workers. Um, and, you know, in terms of the, the scale of this, uh, in places like the UAE, there's so many people from India and Pakistan and Bangladesh coming to work there that it's actually making 88% of their population. So we can sh th these can have really, really significant changes to both the source and the destination countries. Last area I'm going to talk about is conflict that has led to more refugees. So in the 21st century, we've seen a, a big increase in the number of refugees and internally displaced people. Um, on the right here, we've got some of the major um, refugee populations that, and, and the kind of causes. We've got conflict, uh, obviously, in Syria. We've had South Sudan conflict there, Afghanistan, but the political issues in Venezuela uh, and lots of issues in the DRC. These have all meant that in the 90s, we had kind of 41.2 million people that were displaced as refugees or IDPs. But now... By 2020, it's doubled that and it's 82.4 million. So the changes have been significant. Lots of these are to do with um, war and conflict. Some of them can be humanitarian um, disasters, so caused by natural hazards. But a lot of it's either to do with war, conflict or political uh, problems in the country. Um, there are also very clear links between where people come from and where they end up. So... Against you often see kind of in newspapers so kind of some false headlines and what actually uh, most refugees end up in their neighbouring countries. So they will end up, people from Syria are mainly ending up in Turkey, right across the border, Venezuela ending up in Colombia and so on and so on. The, the other kind of ex exemption to that is that there'll be countries that have got more pro-asylum political policies like Germany is a very good example, and so um, they're more likely to take in um, greater numbers of refugees. However, the, most of the people that will be um, leaving their country will normally end up in a developing country rather than a developed country. As I said just then, they're going to be going off into neighbouring countries. They're ending up in these really uh, refugee camps, often on the borders, these refugee camps can suddenly, over a couple of years, go from very few to huge amounts, thousands of people living in them. Um, they're very, very close often to the country they've escaped. Um, and the, the length in which the people can actually end up in these can be significant. So UN average time, uh, according to a World Bank report, was that it's 10 years that some refugees can end up in a camp. And they're often living in very, very poor conditions. Um, limited sanita sanitation, limited uh, education opportunities. So very, very harsh conditions. The, the only re way that people might be able to move is if they do have some sort of income um, or they do have established diaspora networks. So we can see that from the Syria conflict here, people are ending up in Turkey and Lebanon and Jordan in, in large numbers, but some people are making it 
um, into Europe and heading into the global north. But those, again, will depend on, you know, how much money those people have. And do they know people that have already done uh, those routes? Because, you know, it is very, very expensive to be able to do that kind of movement. And also, if you you don't know anyone that's done it, then you're less likely to do it because you don't know necessarily the risks that are involved. 